Kimraha Huladunia, Fauchagu, Ye Old Scots, The Celtic Podcast. On today's show in Fekimich Beck and Gaelic, we will uh, continue our 25 week beginners Gaelic course with Lesson 6. Today we're going to talk about the notorious Scottish pirate Captain William Kidd and her Celtic history segment, and we're going to hear about the Dullahan of Celtic mythology in everyday Celtic ways. Now, throughout the program, we're going to hear music from the Corys, the Blarney Brothers, Monron, and the Selkie Girls. And as always, it's a wee bit of Irish trivia to test your knowledge, start us off. So how long is the Irish president's term, and how many can he or she be limited to? All right. Check out Yield Scott Facebook group, where you can make suggestions, get feedback, post your own memes, and and information and be a part of the whole Celtic culture thing. So, Kersh Maha, let's get started. Enjoy.
right, that was the Fulker by the Corys. And now, hi, Tom and Fekum and Speck and Gaelic. It's time to try a little Gaelic. Now, I do not represent myself as an authority on the Gaelic language, only someone who loves learning it and wants to help others. What I teach comes right from the textbooks of well-respected Gaelic teachers, so I hope you find it interesting, informative, and fun. Today, we will begin a 25-part Gaelic lesson. And we're doing parts uh, lesson six today. And as always, I will display on the screen what I am discussing. All right, lesson six today is asking questions. All right, asking questions is essential to conversing in any language. In this section, we will learn seven question words in the present tense. In later sections, we will learn other tenses, other question forms, and how better to answer them. Expressing here, there, and yonder, and this, and that, and over there, are very um, similar and easy to confuse. Knowing this will help with asking questions in Gaelic. All right, we're going to move on here. So, and show is here, and shin is there, and shoot is yonder. So, show is this, shin is that, shuit is that. Ha, mari an show. Mary is here. Chanel mari an shin. Mary isn't there. Ha, mari an shuit. Mary is over yonder. And ku show. This dog. And ku shin, that dog. And ku ut, that dog, way over yonder. It's kind of, you don't really <laughs> say it, it's kind of implied. All right, questions in the present tense. You have ko, which is who, which koha shin, who is there, or koha ak endorse, who is at the door. You have kimmer. Which is how? Kimra ha a. How is he? Or Kimra ha u. How are you? You've already heard that one. Um, Kimra hanas u. How do you say? And you add the English word. That's a very helpful phrase to learn. Kimra hanas u. Insert the English word. Ounce the Gaelic. How do you say? whatever in Gaelic. All right. Cunha, which is when. Cunha ha um, a chin. When is she coming? J, which is what? J ha u a janif. What are you doing? Koviet. How many? Sometimes this is also spelled um, kioviet. But koviet ku Aha Akit. How many dog is that you? Kerson. Kerson aha and cat and show. Why is the cat here? And of course the last one which is Ketcha. Now beware, Ketcha will always be different. Okay? So Ketcha means where. Catch a veil and dunya. Where's the man? Catch a veil and dunya shin. Where's that man? Alrighty. And we're going to move on to some sentences to translate into English. Starting with number one. Kimrahashiv. Two. Koha Akendoris. Three. Kunyaha Iet Achian. Four. Jeha Uajanov five Koviet Nahoin Ach and Unik six Karsanaha and Doris Fosklicher. All right, that's it for Fekimich Beck and Gaelic. I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, the diamond. Is a ship me lads for the day be straight she's bound and the key it is I'll garnish it with bonny lasses round Captain Thompson gives the orders to sail the ocean wide where the
the sun, it never sets me lights, nor darkness thins the sky. And it's cheer up, me lads, let your hearts never fail. For the bonnie ship, the diamond goes a fishing for the whale. Along the quay at Peter he the lassies stand around with their shawls all pulled about them and their salt tears running down. I don't you weep, my bonny lass, though you be left behind. For the rose will grow on Greenland's ice before we change our minds. And it's cheer up, me lads, let your hearts never fail. For the bonny ship, the diamond goes a fishing for the whale. Here's a help to the good ship Hercules, likewise a Mary Jane. And here's to the Battle of Montrose and the Diamond Ship of Fame. We wear the trousers, oh the white, and the jackets, oh the blue. When we return to Peter Heed, we'll have sweet parts anew. And it's cheer up, me lads, let your hearts never fail. For the bonny ship, the diamond goes a fishing for the whale. Aye, it'll be bright both day and night till the green and lads come home. With a ship that's full of oil, me lads, and money to our name. We'll make the cradle for to rock, and the blanket for to tear. And every lass in Peter Heed sing hush by my dear. And it's cheer up, me lads, let your hearts never fail. For the bonny ship, the diamond goes a-fishing for the whale. And it's cheer up, me lads, let your hearts never fail. Ship the Diamond by the Blarney Brothers. Alright, today on Celtic History Break, the topic is going to be the notorious Scottish pirate, Captain William Kidd. Now, the Scottish city of Dundee stands on the north bank of the Firth of Tay, which feeds into the North Sea on Scotland's eastern coast. There are many notable people who were born or associated with Dundee, but there are few who have so much myth and legend surrounding them as Captain Kidd. The notorious Scottish pirate was born in Dundee around 1655. He immigrated to New York and is thought to have become a seaman's apprentice, and then by 1689 was a member of a French-English pirate crew sailing the Caribbean. On one such voyage, William de Kidd became a captain. Nobody knows exactly why or how, but when he returned he was captain. In 1691, he met and married Sarah Bradley Cox Orscht, a wealthy New York widow. Now, during the war between England and France in the 1690s, Captain Kidd became a successful privateer in charge of the vessel Blessed William. Now, he was part of a small fleet defending the small English colony of Nevis and American and English trade routes with the West Indies. The English did not pay the soldiers for their defense services, telling them instead to gain their income from the capture of enemy ships, which had, of course, had valuable cargo. Now, these actions also included the attack and plunder of ports on French islands, island colonies. Captain Kidd had the misfortune, though, to be involved as a privateer at a time when the rules changed. And then, of course, it made privateers pirates overnight. Privateers were pirates authorized by the government, and they were authorized to attack and pillage ships of enemy nations. Now, in a manner, he was kind of caught between two stools. On the 11th of December, 1695, Richard Coote, first Earl of Bellamont, who was also a member of English Parliament and a colonial governor, of New York, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire, met with Captain Kidd. Now, he requested Captain Kidd attack other pirate ships, along with any enemy French ships with whom the English were at war. Now, this enterprise was commissioned by several English lords, the aim being to seize as much loot and return to England where the treasure could be shared amongst um, Captain Kidd, his crew, and the lord investors. Now, it was to result in a voyage more than any other. 
that was to cement um, Captain Kidd's reputation as a pirate and his image in history and folklore. In late January, 19, I'm sorry, 1698, they sighted the ship uh, Queda Merchant. Captain Kidd and his crew attacked and took the ship and its valuable cargo, rumored to be worth 70,000 pounds. However, the problem was that the ship was Indian-owned and under hire by Armenian merchants, and so flying Armenian colors. It was captained by an Englishman and had a mostly Indian crew. The factor that made Captain Kidd think it was a legitimate target and therefore appropriate to the terms of his commission was that the ship's voyage had been promised safe passage by the French. The Quetta merchant's Captain Wright subsequently informed him that an agent for the English East India Company had also brokered the voyage. Now this was clearly developing into a problem for Captain Kidd because looting this ship could raise major concerns in England. Nevertheless, he decided that his crew could vote on whether to take the ship and its cargo, which they agreed to do. At this stage, he did not understand the seriousness of the situation. Along with the Adventure Galley, Quita Merchant, and Ruperel, another ship captured by Captain Kidd and given the name November, they set sail for Cochin and Caligulan Harbor, the idea being to sell some of the goods to finance his trip back to England. Much of the cargo was sold for gold. However, four ships of the Dutch East India Company were pursuing him by this time. So Kidd gave orders that his group of three ships separate and meet again at St. Mary's Island in Madagascar. Now, on arriving at St. Mary's Island, he made the decision to attack a ship belonging to pirate Robert Culliford. When the other ships, November and Quetta Merchant, arrived at the island, things did not go according to plan. The majority of his crew mutinied and went over to the Robert Culliford. <clears throat> With the few crew members that remained loyal, he negotiated to retain their share of the treasure. He set off on Quinta Merchant, which he now named the Adventure Prize. His aim was to get to New York, avoid main shipping ports, avoiding main shipping ports. It was on this journey that he first learned that he was now a wanted pirate, and there were orders to arrest Captain Kidd and his crew. He bought another ship, then left his other ship, Adventure Prize, and his remaining crew off the small island of Santa Catalina, uh, Santa Catalina with a promise to return. Now, Captain Kidd had decided to continue his journey towards New York. In his mind, it appeared to be uh, a determination to persuade Billamont and his backers that he was still loyal to them and not a pirate. Captain Kidd was eventually persuaded to go to Boston, but it was done by a false promise of clemency by Bellamont. Once he was there, he was arrested, but however, he refused to reveal the location of the adventure prize. He thought the treasure aboard ship could be used as barter for his freedom. Captain Kidd is also said to have deposited some of his treasure on Garnier's Island located in the southeastern end of Suffolk County, New York. Other islands are uh, also said to contain the buried treasure of Captain Kidd. Again, hoping to use his knowledge of the location of this buried treasure as a bargaining tool. He was imprisoned for a year before being sent back to England. He faced charges of five counts of piracy and the murder uh, found guilty, and on 23rd May, 1701, he was publicly executed by hanging. Now, there is no doubt that the exploits of Captain Kidd caught the imagination of the public at this, the time of his trial, and have ever since. Mythology and le legend have 
inevitably groan with stories of piracy on the high seas, intrigue, mutiny, and buried treasure. They have inspired and contributed to literature, such as Treasure Island by Scottish author Robert Louis Stevenson, as well as poems and songs. There is also the lure of undiscovered buried treasure, which has been a lure to treasure hunters ever since his death. Searches for Captain Kidd's hidden booty have been conducted on Oak Island in Nova Scotia and Suffolk County, Long Island in New York, where Graniers Island is located, Charles Island in Milford, Connecticut, the Thimble Islands in Connecticut, the Kono Island in Westport, Connecticut, and other places. However, it seems only one person really knows the location of this hidden treasure, and he has taken that secret with him to the grave. All right, that's it for the Celtic History Break. Sailing ships and sailing men will sail the open water Where the only thing that matters is the wind inside the main So all you loving mothers keep your eyes upon your daughters For the sails will mend their tatters and the mast will rise again The squares of canvas dancing over the horizon You can hear the shanty waving to the heaving of the men You can feel the seas up to your knees And you know the sea is rising And you know the clipper's day has come again To the men on high the bosun's cry commands a killing strain Till every mother's son begins to pray With a hearty shout she comes about and heads in ship has never seen a better day. Sailing ships and sailing men will sail the open water, when the only thing that matters is the wind inside the main. So all you loving mothers, keep your eyes upon your daughters, while the sails will bend their tatters and the mast will rise again. Dreams are all that makes her go And the magic of the wind upon her sails We'd rather fight the weather than the fishes down below God help us if the rigging ever fails As the timber creaks, the captain speaks above The vessel groans Till every soul on board can hear the call Well, it's nothing but the singing of the ship inside her bones and this is when she likes it best of all Sailing ships and sailing men will sail the open water When the only thing that matters is the wind inside the main So all you loving mothers keep your eyes upon your daughters For the sails will in their tatters and the mast will rise again The clipper's nose is plowing fields of green Where fortune takes the crews, we wish them well Where men can be when lost at sea Is somewhere in between The regions of a heaven and a hell They'll be sailing eastern harbors And the California shore If you set your mind to see them, then you can as you count each mast go sailing past, you're prouder than before, and you know the clipper's day has come again. Sailing ships and sailing men will sail the open water, where the only thing that matters is the wind inside the main. So all you loving mothers, keep your eyes upon your daughters, for the sails will mend their tatters and the mast will rise again. Keep your eyes upon your daughters 
All right, that was Day of the Clipper, also by the Villarney Brothers. Now it's time for Everyday Celtic Ways. Today we're going to talk about the Dula, Dulahan of Celtic mythology. The Dulahan is also known as the mythological headless horseman and the embodiment of the Celtic god Crom Du, a malevolent harbinger of death whose roots lie in Celtic mythology. He is said to be a fertility god who demanded blood sacrifice in the form of decapitation. His is the story of a headless rider who roams the lands of Ireland looking for victims whose lives he intends to take. In turn, the headless horseman has become a key character used in the mythology of many other cultures, as well as in many modern horror stories. The Dullahan is most well known for his headless appearance, and there are many stories that suggest how he lost his head, one of which being that he was a soldier in his previous life and had his head taken from him in battle. However, some stories suggest that he already um, has his head and that he rides with a darker purpose believed to be so bitter about his own death that he searches for other souls to take with him to the afterlife, while other stories say his curse can only be broken by collecting a certain number of souls in order to buy favor in hell and secure a place where he will not be tormented. His roaming has been depicted as him searching for souls for some demented purpose for all eternity. Now, he is commonly portrayed as either riding on the back of a black horse or riding a black carriage that is pulled by six black horses. It is said that these horses ride so quickly and ferociously that fire emanates from both their nostrils and their hooves as they strike the ground. The carriage that some believe he rides is made of old coffins, crumbling tombstones, and the bones of rotting flesh. This vision meant to indicate his evil intent to take innocent lives. Now he wears a long, tattered black coat that flows behind him as he rides through the lands, and he is known to hold his severed, rotting head high in the sky as a guide and search for the souls that he is destined to take. Now his severed head has a terrible appearance, covered in rotting flesh, that gives off a strong odor of rotting cheese and has the complexion of stale dough. The mouth is split into a terrifying grin as he finds joy in taking the lives of others. His eyes are lit up with an evil fire and dart back and forth constantly looking for the next victim. No locked gate stays closed when he approaches. They burst open to let the evil do land through and close on their own after he has left. As he makes his way through towns and villages after dark, the people hide behind their curtains to look him in the eyes would immediately blind you. This <clears throat> he causes by whipping their eyes out with a mitt while a whip made from a human spine. He has the ability to speak only once on a journey, and that is to say the name of the person whose life he wishes to take. <clears throat> Once the Dullahan states this name, and that person hears it, their soul is called to appear to death, and there is no defying that call. The Dullahan is believed to appear after sunset on feast days, which is when people know to be weary of looking outside after the sun has gone down. The only thing they can fright, that can frighten or harm him is precious metal, which when thrown on the ground before him can cause him and his horses to suddenly stop in their path and turn to flee. During the period when the story of the Dullahan was most popular in Ireland, families were likely to possess gold. As such, they were told to use their gold to frighten him if he called upon their house. It is said that he called upon a young Irish girl once, and when she appeared in front of him, he spoke her name, but she did not go to death. He pulled the girl close to see why, when she thrust a gold ring into his heart, sending him to hell, 
in an afterlife of torture and torment. The girl could not go to death, you see, because she was deaf and never heard her name called, although she did know the legend. The Celtic god Chrome Dew demanded human lives every year to be sacrificed and hidden to his name, and the method of sacrifice he asked was decapitation. In the 6th century, when Christianity came to Ireland, these sacrificial rituals were condemned, and as Christianity grew in popularity, they stopped altogether. This is when the story of the Dullahan first became prevalent, as the Irish people believed that Chrome Dew took the physical form of the Dullahan in order to continue getting the sacrificial souls that he had called for since his creation. The myth of the Dullahan has evolved as a human form of Chrome Dew into many different depictions of the Headless Horseman in various cultures. The legend of Sleepy Hollow is, uh, in America is based on this Irish legend, telling the story of a soldier who lost his head in the American Revolution by a Hessian, which is a German mercenary, and rose during the festival of Halloween, which is an ancient feast day, to search for it. He is also found in a number of German stories, such as the, the tales of the Brothers Grimm. Um, other German stories tell of a hordeless has, hordeless, headless horseman who blows a horn to warn huntsmen not to ride, as death will befall them that day. Thus, the legend of the Dullahan, one of the most represented Irish legends, continues to live on, for no other reason than just to scare us. All right, that's it for Everyday Celtic Ways. Oh, eyes of my darling, come with me. I want to go with you, leave this country, to leave my father's dwelling, this house and the land. So away goes Jamie, his love in his arms. They go over hills and mountains and glens, traveling on. Oh, my.
is crying and begging is she The fault is in Jamie's, the blame lies with me I forced him to leave and run away with me And I'll die if I can't save my boat, Jamie Good Lord, he has stolen her jewels and her rings Oh, watches and amber, all my precious things And it's cost me a fortune Thousands of pounds And I'll take the life of Jamie Before I lie in the ground Good Lord, I gave them As a token of love And when we are parted I'll have them removed But a true lover's token Well, on your right hand And think of me, darling When you're in a foreign land I'm That was Bold Jamie by the Selkie Girls. Well, that's it for today's show. Hope you liked it. Trying to keep it interesting, informative, and fun while showing you the beauty of all things Celtic. I'd like to thank everyone for all the support and kind words and all the new subscribers. Top of Love character. Thank you, friends. Now, before I let you go, the trivia question answer. Now, how long is the Irish president's term? And how many is she or he limited to well that would be seven years and of course they're only limited to two terms which is good that's 14 years that's kind of a long time all right remember to check out my youtube channel the yield scott and my learn the gallic song videos and my celtic podcast videos and all the speaking our language videos and i've got a few uh celtic movies and scottish movies on there and uh plenty more all right, my Facebook group as well, Yield Scott, where you can give me your insights and input on all things Celtic. Martian Lee Vendrasta, bye for now. I'm going to let you go with a song, Fingal's Cave by Monroe.